ladies and gentlemen, it's time. Oh fuck, I, I didn't mean to end it that quickly, God damn it. Time, boys! It's time for the monarch to return to Mother Russia. Let's go. Well, now that we got that done, hello there. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Dogboat333. Say hello, Twitch chat. Welcome to another beautiful day of Hearts of Iron 4. Let me see. Let's say, let me say hello to the chat real quick. Potato I Aim. How you doing, my friend? Raptor, nice to see you again. It's been a long time. I've missed ya. Hello, Selassie FN. I probably butchered that, and I apologize if I do. Egghead, how are ya? It's great to be here. Glad to have you all here. Niche, good as always. And, uh, it's time to hop into a good old game, a nice streamed game. Real treasures are ours, exactly. The, the, uh, Mr. Turtle gets it. it it's Tetris are ours. So, we're going to go ahead and hop in to West Russia once again. Can we return to Monkey? Maybe another game. Another game we will do that. But right now we're returning to Monarchy. We're heading back to West Russia. Probably... I've probably played in West Russia more in this game than anywhere else. But you know what? I'm glad to be here right now. Because we're playing... Vladimir III. Also known as Chadmir III. The rightful heir to the Romanov throne. As the West Russian Revolutionary Front surged towards Moscow, the Germans were desperate for assistance to halt their advance. They found that in Vladimir Romanov, rightful heir to the Russian Empire, who had long dreamed of retaking his shattered homeland. Permitted to assemble a division of white exiles and volunteers, Vladimir was able to participate in the counteroffensive against the Revolutionary Front. Unexpectedly for the Germans, however, the Revolutionary Front began to collapse as the Wehrmacht's own offensive stalled. Vladimir did not. Vladimir's did not, advancing to and seizing control around the la lands around Vyatka. Establishing a pocket of monarchist rule, Tsar Vladimir III now rules into, as a reluctant autocrat, while preparing to retake and restore the rest of the nation, knowing that it will take a strong hand to reunite Russia, but hoping that his subjects will eventually have a voice in the government. The imperial state faces many challenges, including bickering generals, rival political cliques, and even questions of his own role and purpose in the government. Very soon, the time will arrive when these questions will have to be answered, and the fate of both Ro the Romanovs and the Russian Empire decided for all. Please let this be a normal Tsar ride. We, we'll, we'll try for it. I'll, pro I'll, I'll try for it. What do we got? West Russia is one of the most chaotic regions. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, we got, what, one, two, three, four, five guys who can unify this area compared to what? Three here. Four here. One, two, three, four. Six here, actually. The east is probably the most chaotic, but West Russia isn't too far off. So, here we are. We'll go ahead and start up. Fox and how you doing? Nice to see ya. Glad to have ya. You found any Easter eggs in TNO? Define Easter eggs. I, I found some fun stuff that, you know, funny callbacks and all that. So, kind of that, yeah. Oh crap, nine viewers by the way. Hello everyone. I I'm not used to getting this many viewers at this time around. Dolvanger Brigade Russian Reunification when? Ooh. One of these days. Uh, 
What, what, what was the old focus? We gotta make our way to Tokyo to do unspeakable things to the royal family. It's gonna be fucking cursed, but I'm doing Tabby soon enough, so I, it, it can only get so much worse than Tabby. Anyum. The Principality of Fiatka. Trophy grow up and path one. Ooh. The near total collapse of Soviet authority in the wake of the West Russian War has, over the years, resulted in all manners of ambitious warlords rising through the ashes and staking their claim to Russia. One such group is a ghost from Russia's turbulent past, the remnants of a Romanov dynasty led by Vladimir III and his allies. During the West Russian War, the hard-pressed German forces allowed a division of European emigres loyal to the exiled Vladimir Kirillovich to join the fight against the resurgent Red Army, where they would play a key role in a desperate Wehrmacht offensive. Although the Germans were eventually forced to withdraw, the monarchists pushed on regardless, and were able to establish a permanent foothold in Vyatka. Now Vladimir III and the emigre clique oversee the strongest bastion of monarchism in Russia. That being said, Vyatka is beginning to face internal divisions. The emigre clique bicker among themselves and compete for political dominance, while the antiquated bureaucracy of the principality continues to cause problems as time marches on. The Okorona, the principality's secret police, led by Boris Smyslovsky. Smyslovsky. You're done for school today? There you go, Mikhead. Nice. Welcome, by the way. Has so far been a successful in ensuring stability for the regime, but the question of how much power they should wield remains. These issues will need to be addressed before any serious plans for reclamation can begin. Internally, the principality is divided between three emigre cliques of equal import. First are the constitutional democrats, led by the emigre Roman Ghul, who represents the liberals. They wish to create a functioning constitutional monarchy complete with guaranteed rights for minorities. Second, the solidarists, led by Alexander so Heniston are staunch nationalists with some authoritarian tendencies. That being said, they still wish for some degree of reform from the antiquated system of yesteryear. Finally, there is Vasily Shulgin's faction, the All-Russian National Union. Shulgin is a politician of the old, Nicola of the old school, with a history of, serving date of service dating back to the days of Tsar Nicholas II. Like the liberals, he favors constitutionalism as well, but does not wish to disrupt the traditions of the old empire. Externally, Vyatka is surrounded by potential threats. To the southeast, the Madman of the Aryan Brotherhood serves as the most pressing threat. To the north, the unstable Republic of Komi serves... stirs. Is uh, unpredictable and should be careful monitoring. While the front stirs. If Russia is to unite... If Vyatka is to unite Russia, conflict with them is inevitable. Meanwhile, raids from the Tatars and Bashkir warlords to the west are, and south are common, but are unlikely to escalate to full-blown conflict. For now. Further to the southwest, however, is Andrei Vlasov and the so-called Russian Liberation Army, based in Samara. Unlike the Tatars, they harbor ambitions of expansion and may cause problems in the future if left unchecked. To the east lies the warlords of Berzniki and Ghani. Although Berzniki pledges their resources to us, their governor may have ambitions of his own. On the other hand, relationships with Ghani have mostly been cordial and may be possible to sway them to our cause. Prince Valley Vyatka now stands poised to undertake the arduous task of reuniting Russia once and for all. Will Russia find itself ruled by a czar once more? Only time will tell. So, we get to decide between constitutionalism or the old government. We prepare the Principality's armies for conflict with rival warlords, and we unify the Russian Empire once more. So, here we go, chat. Tsunami Bog. Destiny lies ahead. Do I have an Instagram account for the channel? I do not. I have a personal Instagram account that I barely use myself, so I don't really bother with that. The only social media I really bother with, Snapchat for personal, Discord for YouTube stuff. You'll choose Sotoniskin. Oh, probably not a bad pick, but Ghoul has better unification music, so that, that's what we're going with, probably. Plus, let's see, I think, I know, I think... Mr. Mocha Lover, I think, did Off Dem. Off Dem or Conservative Dem. I don't know if anyone's done have, has done Lib Dem, so I kind of want to go for that. Mix it up a bit. So, here we are. We're led by Vladimir III. We're currently despotist, but that'll change eventually. He did Off. Okay. Yeah. So, we are the rightful layer, which gives us some extra PP and some extra stability. Very nice. Born into exile in 1917... 
Grand Duke Vladimir Kirillovic Romanov became head of the exiled imperial family of Russia in 1938 following the death of his father, Kirill Vladimirovic, cousin of the late Tsar Nicholas II. Residing in Pr Brittany when the Second World War, War hits, he soon found himself and his family in German custody. At the insistence of German authorities, he soon began collaborating, making radio broadcasts, encouraging Russian defection from the Soviet regime. Offered the regency of Ukraine at the end of the war, he turned it down on the grounds that it would unacceptably divide Russia. Despite the war's end, however, Vladimir could not return to Russia. The Germans were concerned that, like it as has happened with Lasov, his popularity could undermine their rule. It wasn't until the West Russian War that he was able to convince them to permit his rallying of a division of monarchists and exiled whites to lead a widely successful counteroffensive. As the Wehrmacht offensive stalled, Vladimir's did not breaking through to establish a pocket of monarchist rule in Russia. In the years since, the newly proclaimed Tsar Vladimir III has, has had little success in expanding the pocket and has found many domestic headaches besides. Now the Tsar awaits, biding his time until the moment when he can strike and reclaim all of Russia his by divine birthright. United States of Russia, Rebel. Rebel is fun. We're doing that at 1500 subs. Ooh. I don't know if I agree with that potato aim. I think that that's a that's a bold claim. I don't know if I, I agree with that. Anyway, so we got Luftwaffe terror bombings, which is just shit all around. Depressing regularity. Luftwaffe bombings, bombers from the airfields of the Moscovian fly over the warlord states of Western Russia, bombing everything they can see and severely affecting nearly every aspect of Russian life as a result. Three aviators elbowing us out, but it's not good. Even with that, we have an unrepentant reaction. Which gives us some recovery rate, some stability, and a little hit to factory output. Not so nice there. Ever since the fall of the old empire, Russia has suffered, crushed beneath one tyrant after another. Communism and its cloaked agent socialism have worked tirelessly to take away what little the Russian people have left. And to this, the Tsar has proclaimed, no more. The empire will rise again, the communists will be destroyed, and with the Tsar's just rule, peace will again and return to this great land. There we go. We have the Tsar and himself extra political power, and some war support. Like in the old days, bizarre rules of absolute authority. Lately, however, he has witnessed the rise of liberalism and democratic ideals within the heart and minds of his subjects. Though many advise him to ignore these developments altogether, Vizar knows well he stands on a precipice, where the love of his people could very turn into hatred, the way it has before. He must therefore soon make a choice, to rule alone as his ancestors did, or give the people their own say in his government. Then we have military infighting. Jesus, fuck. That is not nice at all. Uh, the White Army, or what remains of it, has never been a unified front. Through a sh though a shared hatred of communism unites them, the question of how a united Russia should be governed threatens to shatter the unity of his ours armies. While some believe in the old ideals, others petition for democracy, and even a few speak of the strengths of fascistic regimes. Bazaar alone is the only thing keeping them in line, and even then, only just. It is clear that if a state is to rebuild what was once lost, it must ensure that the army stands united. And then finally, the we have the mechanical plant, which gives us efficiency cap, factory output, and some nice production cost reductions to infantry, support, and towed artillery. What I feel like the AB are worshipping the German bombers and thank them for bombing them. They are! They are the ultimate simps. The AB are greatly flattered by the idea that the Germans would notice them, even if it is by bombing the crap out of them. Exactly. Thank you for bombing us, Germany. Bomb us harder, Daddy. That, that, that's them. That is them. So, we have a decisions, a rating, we have a state of economy and popular support. So let's start with popular support. Despite these Tsar's actions, popular support for modern for monarchism in Russia is not guaranteed. If Tsar wishes to both maintain and expand his support among ordinary Russians, he needs to make efforts. Our support is low, and then we have a state of economy. One revolution, two massive wars, and 20 years of bombing have left the Russian economy in a ruin. 
If we are to pursue unification, we must take action and ensure domestic and economic strength. All right, well, see you in a bit, Raptor. Thanks for hopping in. So, yeah, we can invest in infrastructure and all this stuff. Which we'll get to coming up. We just need some political power first. So, um, engineering. Get those improved computing machines. And what? Probably civilian construction. Yeah, civilian construction. Yeah, civilian construction. We got some f factories we can get working on building. Let's get some civvies in Vyatka. Russia's economy at this point make, probably makes North Korea than our online looks like it's booming. In West Russia, yeah. Pretty much. Because the economy here is literally booming. It's being destroyed by the Germans. Anyhow, so. Oh, we actually have military factories. Let's take a look at this first. Next, I think, towards guns. Why not? We got our boys. Our armies. Field marshals. Let's go with... Let's get Evgeny Messner. Actually. No, uh... But where is... Smolovsky? It looks pretty good. Our economy's a bomb? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, literally. And then, who do we want for generals? Winter specialist? That's not bad. He's kind of detached from this guy, though. Um, defense and logistics. I'm liking the cut of Vladimir Granatov's jib. So I think we'll do... We'll go with him. And I don't really know where to put these guys, so we'll just keep them hanging around for now. Hmm. I'm trying to decide what... Well, we gotta start with the Return of the Emperor, of course, so we might as well start with that. The emergence of Yatka, a monarchist state in a land that has executed its previous monarchs, was one of the stranger outcomes of a West Russian war. And yet, to many, it was understandable. Communism has utterly failed the Russian people, leading them into subjugation under a foreign regime, and a return to earlier times when Russia imposed its will on others, rather than being imposed upon itself, was inherently attractive. Tsar Vladimir has shown to the people the qualities expected of emperor, sharing in their pain from, from and anger at the German bombers that terrorize them regularly. And he has pledged that in due time he will see their skies cleared, their lands reclaimed, and the imperial eagle proudly displayed from the Volga to the Amor. You've got an army, a bunch of boomers running your army, no wonder it's falling apart. Yeah, you're not wrong. You got some old fellas. Hopefully they won't be boomers, boomers and illiterates. Uh, Vyatka, um, nowadays Vyatka is called Rikov. So look up Rikov. <clears throat> Roman Borisovic Gul was once again on the streets of Vyatka, campaigning with his followers for democracy and minority rights, and ignoring the ever present danger of German bomber raids. Marching towards the city center, he made sure that all those who knew, saw him knew that fundamentally he was calling for equality within the principality. As his march continued, he was heartened by the many citizens who expressed fair support and admiration for his efforts, directly or otherwise. He hoped that one day, Tsar Vladimir would say the same, though he did not expect it would come soon. For Roman, who had supported the agenda of reform ever since the establishment of principality after the West Russian War, leading these marches and calling for these reforms had become second nature. Indeed, even if he did not believe his actions to be groundbreaking, he knew that he could if he could just earn the favor of the Tsar and his ministers, real change could be brought to Vyatka. The shadow of authoritarianism would be dispelled by the light of democracy, and through the establishment of a constitutional monarchy, Russia could just honor its past, while at the same time marching towards its future. A noble goal. God knows that more could use some imperial eagles right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only good thing about 
Mogadon. Not Mogadon. Mogadon has some good stuff, man. I'm more the only good thing is that we can get this back and that back. And that's really it. And apparently the writing is great in a, a more. Yeah, and the cat events. Yeah, the cat events. The return of the emperor. <sighs> hmm. What do we want to get working on? I'm thinking let's look to the economic graveyard. Oh, I'm looking real quick. All of this. We got some good stuff all around. Yeah, an economic graveyard. That'll work. Across all of Western Russia, regular bombing missions by the German Luftwaffe make it impossible to maintain an economy of any reasonable size and complexity. Uh, R-Y-K-O-V. Rikov. Anything resembling a factory is identified, targeted, and destroyed. This is by design. The Germans know that if they can keep us from industrializing, they can keep us from unifying again. We not, may not be able to build an industrial base at the moment, but that does not mean we must remain idle. We can evaluate our resources, identify skilled workers, and plan future development sites. We can prepare as much as we are able. If we are to reclaim Russia for the Romanov dynasty, we must have industry. One day the bombings will... They must stop. And when they do, we must be ready. Stop something from Germans after they refuse to send one back. Oh yeah. Um, I know that um there's an event where Yaki in the US gets a letter from uh Rodzevsky saying for solidarity and Yaki goes on a weird rant about how, you know, slobs are inferior. All the all the typical shit you'd expect from Francis Parker Yaki. That one's kind of funny, but that's an America-only event, I want to say. Although, maybe a more gets it. I'm not sure. <sighs> Surrounded by Confederates within the National Union of Solidarists, it was nevertheless clear to any observer that Alexander Isaevich Solkistian stood above them in both vision and support. No matter where he went, Alexander, a man of humble origins, was congratulated on his achievements. In truth, he achieved much of in his leadership of the NTS, assumed upon the rapid departure of his predecessor to the Komi Republic, following one too many failed gambits. Today, however, he was addressing a party conference, as it, and as he stepped at the podium, his audience waited for their charismatic leader to speak, but even they did not expect him to speak so clearly about the future, an eventual goal of the party as a whole. He spoke about the many myriad flaws of the old communist regime. He spoke about the many myriad laws of the old empire. And then, at last, he spoke about a vision for the future. About a Russia reborn, built upon a strong foundation of nationalist pride and military strength, striking out to reclaim all of her constitute lands. By the time it was finished, all in attendance, himself included, could not but be certain that Russia would inevitably return to glory once more, and that the NTS under Sotestian would lead that charge. But the path to reclamation is difficult. All right. Um. Hmm. So we have 23 days for these focuses. Not a bad length. It'll keep us busy for a while. Hmm. Crushed under decades of oppression, poverty, war, and terror, there's very little that can still shock a Russian and thus capture their attention. And yet, such an event has occurred. It has been announced that the Reich has landed a man on the moon, extending the reach of humanity within the solar system. At, although many in the government and nation, within the government and nation, surrounded as they are by destruction and want, have taken this as yet another reminder of how far Russia has fallen, not all are reacting similarly. Indeed, others are being galvanized to action. 
one of these others is Bazaar himself, who has read numerous reports about a sudden surge in interest in scientific pursuits. Aeronautical engineering, another element of higher education among the populace. He has consequently encouraged expanded instructions in these fields, as much as it is reasonably possible in the Principality's schools. And who knows? Maybe, just maybe, one day a Russian will make it to space as well. One day. What do we got? Um, Spear playthrough after putting off for a while. Whew. How'd you enjoy it? How are you enjoying them? Both of them. Anyway, Bears Nikki Blues. Alexander Kazimek, a white Russian emigre, first became involved in politics prior to the Second World War as the leader of the Young Russians. Encompassing beliefs from across the political spectrum, some quite radical, many struggled to understand it, by extension, his ideology and ultimate ambitions. Despite this, he was a loyal follower of the Tsar during the West Russian War, and following it was rewarded with the governorship of Berezniki, a former frontier territory surrounded by radicals, it was eventually pacified by Kazimbek and his followers. Despite all likelihoods to the contrary, the territory, now a vice royalty of Mulatto Rosi, has both survived and thrived. Indeed, reports from Tsar's representatives, the Tsar's representatives, Boris Sikosarev, have described both significant industrial devel development as well as the sustainable exploitation of local national resources. These resources, including critical oil and petroleum products, are regularly dispatched back to the Principality, under the careful political supervision of Kazimbek himself. Thus, he is crucial both to maintaining peace and delivering resources from the region. As long as he does that, carefully supervised by Sikosarev, he will maintain his position. Despite this, however, suspicion from members of our government towards Kazimbek continues and many say that his resource deliveries will continue only until he sees an opportunity to fully divorce himself from the Tsar's authority. For now, though, Kazimbek's true motives remain unclear. Would he dare turn against us? I finally understand the sad spear picture when the gang takes over. Yeah. Ah, poor spear. Sorry to feel, feel bad for him, but... It's another event. You get people at YouTube at home can want, pause and read that if they want. Interesting story of nothing else. Assassin strikes at Hitler. Damn. Still not as says Mikhail and Cheetah. Yeah, Mikhail and Cheetah is rough. Ah, oh, they just kidnapped some poor Australian dude and gave him a crown. It's always it's always rough. Placing the finishing touches on a document, Vasily Vitalovic Shulgin looked out the window of his office and watched people walking in cars traversing the city center of Yatka. He had intended for a proclamation he had just finished to be read by all the people of the Principality, potentially also by those elsewhere in Russia, and so it had to be perfect. So few still alive remembered the times of the old Romanovs, having succumbed to age, Bukharin's communist propaganda, or the violence and war that had consumed Russia. And Shulgin believed it his, it, his duty, his purpose, to spread the knowledge once again. In his mind, if he could do so, if he could show the people an alternative to instability and strife, a pathway to greatness, he could help promote the eventual restoration of Azar's authority over all of Russia. After hours of review, Shulgin inspected his documents one final time. A proud declaration of the resilience of the Russian people and the glory of monarchism. It would no doubt bolster the morale of the Principality's citizens. Shulgin was no propagandist, but he well understood that, in hard times, the people needed to be reminded of both the dedication of their czar to them and the similar dedication expected from them in return. Shulgin believed with every fiber of his being that the only thing that could save Russia was a return to the empire he had once lived in and to the strong central authority of the czar. With deep respect, he signed the document and left it on his desk. He would send it to the printing shop tomorrow. A return to the ways of old. Hmm. 
Borman. Hmm. Well, she eyes up. Oh. <clears throat> like he had thousands of times before, Vladimir lit a cigarette, placed it in his mouth, and inhaled. For a moment, he felt relief. Before the cigarette, rolled incorrectly by a no doubt overworked worker and underskilled factory worker, crumbled beneath his fingers. Swearing, he crushed the embers and shivered. He had only been inducted into the order a month ago, and not yet gotten used to the chills of Dawn Patrol. Hearing a twig snap behind him, Vladimir whirled around, readying his rifle as he did so. Expecting a person, he was surprised to find a dog missing one ear, and looking back at him with its head cocked to one side. Letting out a nervous laugh, he reshouldered his rifle and took a step forward. Hello. You look lost. Are you lost? The dog didn't make a sound or moved to retreat as Vladimir knelt beside it and stroked its surprisingly coarse coat, feeling for a moment the rarest of emotions in Russia. Peace. After a short while, the dog whined and pulled away, and Vladimir watched it until it disappeared beyond the horizon. He sat down on a stump, lit another cigarette, taking care to hold it tight, and sighed. Perhaps, as he, he thought, in a way, everyone in Russia was a dog. Just as the dog lost near, everyone in Russia, be they raiders, civilians, workers, guards, or something else, had lost something. Russia was not a hospital place, hospitable place. All that Russia offered to most of its people was hardship. But maybe someday, like that dog, he and everyone else would find a simple kindness in their fellow man. Finishing his cigarette, Vladimir sat and watched the sun rise in front of him. Every dog has its day. Stretch, you got it. Cheaters, old military men vying for power. Chatmir actually has a claim to the throne, pretty much. I mean, you can't get Nikita and Cheetah if Mikhail doesn't win his little gambit, but... Very stretched. But yeah. Why, why would you want Nikita for Cheetah? Other than the rhyming. Why, why would you want that? Just like everywhere else in West Russia, the German Luftwaffe flies regularly over the principality, dispenses terror, misery, and death from above. They bomb everything they see, and nothing escapes their efforts. Not schools, hospitals, factories, houses, and farms, or anything that could be considered to have economic, military, or social value has escaped them. For 20 years, this has continued, shaping the thoughts and practices of an entire generation, and utterly destroying any possibility of a real industrial base in our, or anyone else's, territory. We cannot stop them, but that does not mean we must remain idle. We can investigate alternative economic methods, plan for future expansions, and lay the groundwork for rapid development when, not if, the bombers stop. The resources of the Reich are not infinite, even if they may seem that way to many of our citizens. And when the day comes that our skies are clear, we will be ready. One day the bombers will stop. One day. Let's see. Ooh. Vyaka Distillery sounds not doesn't sound too bad. And we'll do it. To many Russians, a stable supply of good quality vodka is considered as essential as food. As a result of the devastation, both the war and the German bombings, such a product has become scarce, and therein lies an opportunity that the Tsar has proposed to exploit. Potatoes will be planted and farmed in bulk, providing food, employment, and raw materials for the spirit. Distilleries will be reclaimed and reconstructed, or reconstituted, to transform those materials into high quality vodka. Proving yet more employment, addressing domestic demand, and supplying the state with a valuable and highly desired trade good. For revenue from selling vodka, all over Russia will finance other projects, and with every bottle sold, one more Russian will know that their Tsar understands their needs. We brought them with booze, there we go. My hand cannons, Vyatka and Cheetah are the last two left in Russia. Mikhail is allowed to go home and Cheetah's annex. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad head cannon. That's very beautiful thematically what 
What do we got here? Okay, we can use our loot. What do we want to start on, though? Our academic base is going down. So is our poverty rate. Our industrial expertise, too. We'll do schools. We'll build some schools. Hydrate. Funny. Why does Himmler want Tsar Vyatka to win? Okay, I can actually explain this kind of well. He's done with Samara. He thinks the... He thinks Samara is useless at this point. He's not going to support the communist. No, that, that goes against the whole Nazi shtick. Comey is too unstable to put any faith in. The Aryans are just dumb loppers who are going to side with Germany anyway. The Atka has poten the potential to go with the very revanchist nationalists who want to get revenge on Germany. And that'll bring more tension between the Germans and the newly reunified Russia. Russians. And so it's going to cause the most chaos, and Himmler's about chaos. So that's why he wants Vyatka to win. Can I talk about the AB? In a bit. I might mind a bit. Let me read this event first. On a moonlit winter morning, the sky shook with a roar of a hundred engines. It was not a common thing in Russia to hear the planes overhead, but they were usually heralded. Heralded the sign, the arrival of Luftwaffe bombers, hell bent on destruction. The sign would sound. Civilians would seek shelter. The soldiers would fire their rifles to try and scare the enemy away. Once the Germans had to have their fun, the damage was surveyed. Factories would be repaired. The dead would be mourned. And life would carry on, but. Not today. Today was a day of clear skies and con contented people. The planes of Imperial Air Force soared overhead, smoke trailing the sock behind them as it crossed into the air. Every maneuver met with a series of gasp applause, gasps and applause by the audience below. The display had been planned in Azar's honor, a show of a nascent Air Force's strength, but also served as a rare entertainment for the people of Yatka. All non-vital workers were permitted to attend at no cost. Though the nation had certainly given up a larger share of the field and spare parts for this event. Unfortunately for the men of the hour, the air show was a nerve-wracking experience. Vladimir was proud of a fleet of planes in his command, one of the largest in Russia, but he was under no illusions as to the reality of the situation. Shoddy pre-war fighters were piloted by undertrained airmen that seemed only seconds away from crashing into one another at any time. It was a miracle that they had managed to get so many planes in the air without a disaster. Still, even as Vladimir's fingers dug into the arm of his chair, he could not deny the beauty he saw in their potential. Maybe with the right funding and training, this meager convocation of eagles could learn to rule the skies. A broken wing can be mended. Edge, what's up, man? Why does he not want Eastern Siberian nations? His spies can only get to West Russia. He doesn't know anything going on beyond the Urals. That's why. He he doesn't know that Omsk exists or Tiumen or Svetlovsk or probably these guys either. Though, I'd imagine you might know about some of these guys, so. Edge, how's it going? What else can we do? We could raid. Do we want to raid? Eh. I don't think it's worth it. Oh, is it? Hello, duh. They don't have any loot. They don't have any loot. The Aryans don't have loot. If St. George gets loot, that'll be worth raiding because they don't have anything. St. George is always a better option to raid. Spice with a German accent won't last as long in Alms. That too, yeah. <clears throat> Ever since return of Tsar Vladimir to Russia, Alongside of a German military response to the, in the front, he has, unsurprisingly, faced accusations that neither he nor his military have sufficiently distanced themselves from the forces of the Reich. With many of our officers carrying German equipment and having received German training, we have long looked for an opportunity to demonstrate our separation from the German regime. While we hesitate to call it fortunate when such opportunity has presented itself, our commanders have received reports that a small hip -top commu hilltop community near Izvensk has been attacked by a group displaying common Nazi symbols. 
although it is unknown whether they are a German raiding party or merely bandits from the fanatics of Perm, it is known that they are currently besieging the settlement, and that it cannot hold for long. In response, Bazaar orders a small task force, 300 strong and equipped with heavy weaponry, be dispatched to break the siege of a settlement, marked on the military maps as Hill 483, doing so not only to protect Bazaar, protect Will Bazaar protect his people, but he will also prove that neither he nor his military have any remaining sympathy in Nazism or the odious individuals who practice it. First step on a great journey. Yeah, you can't exactly sneak a whole battalion of blonde dudes with blue eyes halfway through Russia. It's very risky. It's a very bold strategy, Cotton. The AB... Okay. A motherfucker, really. Hmm. The Aryan Brotherhood are basically German simps. This guy thinks that, um... He proclaims himself Fuhrer. He proceeds to Germanize the Russian language. His whole shtick is... Aryan is a mindset. It's a state of mind. And the Russians have to be forced to accept that state of mind, basically. And he believes that Slavs are subhumans, even though he is a Slav. Because, you know, that makes sense. <sighs> Failure, damn. The special task force dispatched by Tsar engage the attacking raiders on Slavs at Hill 843 following initial scouting action. Although the raiders were apparently aware of our numerical inferiority, they committed themselves to holding their position, trusting both the terrain as well as their rough fortifications. In retrospect, this was clearly the optimal choice. As our men advanced, the artillery commander refused the order to fire, citing unacceptable risk. Unsupported, our soldiers found themselves pinned down by machine gun fire and suffered heavy casualties before being forced to retreat. So made of it, motivated, the raiders quickly overwhelmed the civilian militia, militia atop the hill and sacked the community before withdrawing from the field. Was bad. I gotta allow that because, uh, you know, it Twitch automatically does not allow the ward Aryan, which, uh, understandable. Although a small action, our performance has led to accusations from both the possible incompetence of and Nazi sympathies within our military. Additionally, it would seem our neighbors have taken notice of our prior performance as well. What a mess. Jesus. Oh, God. A hundred political power loss. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, God. That was rough. <sighs> Whilst the Emperor has tasked his advisors to devise economic strategies to kickstart our crippled economy, Seeing to lead, by example, the Emperor has put forward a proposal of his own to his advisors. When our forces secured the city of Yatka from the Bolsheviks, one of our units stumbled upon a bandit operation in the city producing moonshine and old distillery. Attempts to remove the bandits led to a firefight and their wholesale deaths, but much of the equipment in the building itself was left intact. For the large-scale industry rendering impossible, Rendered impossible due to Luftwaffe bombings, the Emperor is instructed that the distillery should at last be reopened and put to work producing one of Russia's most treasured resources, high-quality vodka. These guys get it. Such small-scale ill industry, but with a significant market across Russia, would provide an excellent boost to our economy, the Emperor believes, and will open the door to more substantial industry in our future. It will be some time before we can produce vodka en masse, enough of a worthwhile quality. But the Emperor has authorized the necess necessary subsidies and investments to allow production to begin. All that remains is to clear up the distillery and get to work. Selling vodka to Russians, we may as well have liquid gold. Yeah, the... the Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I know it's a glitch, it doesn't mean anything, but still, it's always funny to see that. Hmm. Ooh, one infrastructure in every state, that's not bad. Let's get Imperial Austerity going. I wonder how that got there. 
Following an exhaustive audit of the Principality's economy in its entirety, both Vazar and his ministers have been shocked to learn of its truly of its true, highly decrepit state. Factories lie abandoned as artisans produce what little they can in basement workshops. Fields lie fallow as farms focus on substance farming to feed themselves and their families. If action is not taken, our fragile economy will soon collapse entirely. To address this, a plan for austerity has been put for before the Tsar. Severe cuts to services, education, and security will be painful, especially for the many already suffering, but they are necessary. And the Tsar has been very clear. They will not last forever. You always speak on the radio, give that a shot. As a result of a chaotic and violent nature that dominates Western Russia, the people are quick to repeat and embellish the stories and achievements of those considered legends. One group so considered is that of the Free Aviators, former Red Air Force pilots who, from their airfield in the frigid north, rise to engage with German terror, German terror bombings whenever and wherever they can, including over our territory. Although they are communists, they are, unlike many of their ideological brethren, fighting selflessly to protect both Russia and Russians from foreign invaders. As such, any, in an attempt to boost his public perception, secure additional legitimacy, and support these brave pilots, Hazar has, at personal expense, secured a large number of personally decommissioned aircraft, as well as a large number of replacement parts for both of them. He will dispatch all of this, free of charge, to the free aviators, and in doing so, help them fight for the nation he, one day, intends to rule in its entirety. Not a bad idea. Getting good with them. <laughs> Carefully, gingerly, Tekov Rifkin placed two candles into the metal candlesticks. Themselves treasured inheritances from his father. In 20 minutes, the sun would set, work would cease, and the Sabbath would begin. Striking a match, he moved to light them, the warmth in his hands reminding him of his wife and family, as well as feelings about them that he had long thought forgotten. As the candles took the light, and the sun began to set, shadows began to dance around the room. The two points of light in front of him began came blazing towers, calling him to prayer before the eyes of the Lord. Before the day of rest began, Blessed are you, Lord, our God. He began, drawing his deep breath and closing his eyes. The king of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to light the Shabbat candles. The Sabbath had begun, but Yaakov did not open his eyes. He thought of the Jews of the world, so many stolen away. He thought of his wife and children turned to ash. And as he began his final blessing, he would not stop the tears from rolling down his cheeks. A silent prayer against the din of the world. Free aviators and Russian Pacific Fleet be unifiers. That would be fun. I know, I think they're doing a, a sub mod for the uh, for Kamchatka to unify. <clears throat> Hearing the exclamation from behind, his over king thought he knew what was about to happen. The men of the Russian Protective Corps, an anti-Semitic band of thugs masquerading as a monarchist militia, had been had taken to harassing him on the streets, aware of his heritage. They would insult him, block his way, and most generally act in whichever fashion caused him the most trouble. But today it was to be much different, much worse. As they moved to surround him, he moved to walk away, but for the first time one of them grabbed his shoulders. Tightly. By the time he let go, Yakov was surrounded. And then the insults began, and Yakov grew scared. This time they not only came faster, but were also more screamed than bespoken. One of the men, a well-known scion of an uptown family that was close to Bazaar, withdrew a strip of bacon from his pocket and offered it to Yakov, only to watch him shake his head and reply. Another the Jews laughed. <laughs> Boris, I think the dirty Jew doesn't value your generosity. Before Yakov could speak, could try to deny the man's words, Boris had put a, pulled a club from his belt and swung. As Yakov fell to the ground, clutching his head in pain, the rest of the men withdrew their own clubs. 
and began swinging as well. When they had finished and begun searching his body for gold, ruples, or other valuables, Ikko was unconscious. Those on the streets did not intervene, scared of the influence of Boris's family. But from a discreet corner, however, a camera captured the scene in the faces of the perpetrators. In monochrome, to be sure, but also in clear definition. There will be a reckoning. Uh-oh. Well, that's not good. <laughs> 